Good evening and welcome to Policy Talks at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. I'm Matt Grossman, Director of the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research at Michigan State University. Yes, they let a Spartan moderate tonight, but my institute, IPSER, has been working closely with the Ford School's Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy to help Michigan's Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. We're all in this together. The Redistricting Commission is about to start holding 16 public hearings around the state. And tonight, we'll hear from three commissioners and four expert panelists with experience in other states to help make those hearings fair and effective. You'll see the hearing dates now and at closeup.umich.edu, where you'll also find links to many additional resources. Special thanks to Connie Cook and Charlie Beale from Voters Not Politicians for coordinating this great group of presenters. We'll begin with three of Michigan's commissioners, then we'll have them depart to comply with Michigan laws, and we'll have a Q&A with our expert panelists. The questions come from audience members submitted beforehand and tonight. There's still an opportunity to submit questions on YouTube or social media, and Voters Not Politicians will help answer some of the questions directly in the live chat. Although originally scheduled to end at 8, we'll be staying on until 8.15 to get through as many questions as we can. Let me thank the organizers and co-sponsors, the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, Voters Not Politicians, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research, the University of Michigan Program in Practical Policy Engagement, the League of Women Voters of Michigan, and Detroit Public Television. Now please welcome three Michigan commissioners to tell us what they're doing and what they hope to learn from the hearings. Our first presenter will be Douglas Clark from Rochester Hills, followed by Rebecca Zatella from Wayne County, and Dustin Witches from Ypsilanti. Bios for the presenters are available at closeup.umich.edu and in the live chat. And now, Commissioner Douglas Clark. Thank you, Matt. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here this evening. I'm Douglas Clark, a resident of Rochester Hills, Michigan, and a commissioner on the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. As you're aware, the commission consists of four, four individuals that are affiliated with the Republican Party, four that are affiliated with the Democratic Party, and five nonpartisan commissioners. I am affiliated with the Republican Party. However, I'm not active in the Republican Party. I've lived in Michigan since 1977. My education includes a bachelor's and a master's degree. My professional career was as, as an operations and software development manager for large multinational corporations. Uh, additionally, I've spent four years in the military as a captain in the United States Army. I applied for the commission because it was important for me to ensure a fair and impartial redistricting process within Michigan. Strong personal characteristics that I can bring to the commission are objectivity, an ability to work constructively with others, and an honest and sincere approach to addressing the issues of the commission. I have some thoughts on public hearings that I would like to share with you this evening. Public hearings are a very important and significant part of our redistricting process. Let me focus on one aspect of public hearings that is significant. That would be the personal interests of the diverse communities throughout the state. The hearings allow us to listen and understand what each of these communities identify as the important aspects of redistricting in their individual areas. For example, I met uh, with uh, in one of the uh, public meetings in the state and of interest and importance to the city officials in that area was that their town was entirely in the same district rather than the two districts they are currently uh, in. It saves them manpower, money, and they only have to have one set of ballots rather than multiple ballots for the community. Even though this is a simplistic example, it's very important that these types of issues are understood 
by the commission through the public hearings. Now I'd like to introduce one of our other commissioners, Rebecca Zatella. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me here tonight. Um, my name is Rebecca Zatella. I am another member of the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. I am an attorney. I've been practicing law for over 20 years, and my primary area of focus is technology licensing contracting. Um, I applied for the commission because I strongly believe that a citizen-led process is more likely to result in maps that are focused on enabling fair representation and ensuring that everybody's voice is heard. Um, I think one of the concerns with having political parties draw maps is that there tends to be a focus on maintaining power rather than focusing on ensuring fair representation for the citizens. In terms of the public hearings, um, I'm most excited to hear local insights into where people think lines should be drawn. There's lots of different factors that are going to come into play for us. And unfortunately, we are just 13 people and we do not have the deep knowledge and familiarity of individuals who live in particular areas with respect to what makes sense in terms of where to draw lines. Maybe those lines are geographic boundaries, maybe they're freeways, man-made boundaries, but whatever those lines might be, the people who live there are the ones that are going to be able to guide us and give us the best guidance as to where logical district lines should be drawn. Um, in terms of what I think we need to ensure fair and effective hearings. First of all, I am incredibly excited that citizens are actually having a say. As we all know, in the past, redistricting was done in back rooms by political parties where citizens had little to no impact or transparency into the process of how those lines were being drawn and how those maps were created. And so just the mere fact that the citizens have the ability to comment, I think is incredibly exciting. And I hope that the citizens are excited and they come to our public public hearings and they give us the feedback that they haven't been able to give in the past so that we are then informed when it comes to drawing these maps and able and empowered to do um, to create fair and effective maps. Um, I'm going to pass off to my fellow commissioner, Dustin Witches. Dustin. Justin, you're muted. Whoops. <laughs> I guess I'll start over. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, uh, allowing me to be here uh, this evening. Um, and I uh, just wanted to thank everybody. Um, so like they said, my name is Dustin Witches. I am in Ypsilanti. I have been here for two years, but I went to Eastern Michigan University uh, after I graduated high school. I received a bachelor's degree with a concentration in aviation and chemistry. Uh, I know it's kind of odd, but uh, I was able to somehow um, get those two to work for a degree. Uh, and I'm currently pursuing a master's degree in mathematics from Eastern Michigan University as well. Um, so as far as why I wanted to join the commission, uh, is is I I'm, I'm thinking besides drawing fair fair maps, which is of most importance, and making sure that everyone does indeed have uh, their voices heard uh, cor correctly um, and fairly. Uh, I'm also thinking about the, the young people here uh, that are going to be becoming of voting age um, at uh, within the next ten years making sure that they also have a fair uh, chance to be heard in our uh, voting process in the state of Michigan. In regards to what I'm looking to gain from the public comments, uh, I'm solely, well, I'm not solely focused, but I'm, I'm, I'm focused on, on communities of interest. Um, I want to, what I want to gain and and, uh, and understand is where communities that have uh, similar values, uh, how they want to be heard in in um, state legislature and also Congress, uh, which would make sure that they're heard as well. Uh, one thing that stands out to me in, in regards to drawing districts is, is something in, um, I believe Arizona, when they had a map that was drawn and one area way out in the desert was drawn into um, 
I believe, the city uh, and going down a river because they, they connected more with those particular individuals. Um, and then they didn't want to be in the district of, of the ones, the individuals that were right next to them. So, for example, if a community decides to say, we want to ensure that 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 our town is in in this particular district or we want to ensure that uh you know the the town for example splits let's say there's a river running through it for example and they have two very different um belief systems when it comes to politics it makes no sense to 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 potentially put them all in one district in in my opinion we want to make sure that both of those particular areas have uh, the representation that they are looking for. And with that, I am going to turn it back to uh, uh, Dr. Matt Grossman. And uh, I thank you again for being here. Thanks so much to the commissioners. They'll now exit now to join us on uh, YouTube. A reminder that you'll be able to join them at the public hearings with the schedule in the chat or at closeup.umich.edu. We're even ahead of schedule and we're ready for our expert panel with Q&A. So I'd now like to introduce the panel. We have Kathy Fung from the National Redistricting Director for Common Cause. Colleen Mathis, former chair of the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. Andre Parvenu, a former state commissioner on California's State Redistricting Commission, and Nancy Wang, executive director of Voters Not Politicians. Now, Nancy, I'd like you to start us off. We have these public hearings coming up. What should we expect to see? Uh, what are these communities of interest that some people will be submitting and what else should we see? Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, I'm Nancy Wang, Executive Director of Voters Not Politicians. Uh, we're the grassroots group that um, helped to put the issue on the ballot to end gerrymandering here in Michigan. And we are thrilled to be supporting the implementation right now of the Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission and the community mapping process. Um, and, you know, I think everyone has heard now from um, some of our state commissioners, which is fantastic. Uh, I think what we're going to see um, when you tune into these public hearings, and I hope all of you will, is that we we get to talk with our with our commissioners whose job it is and who I think really um, are are driven and um, you know committed to drawing fair maps that with you know input by the people that reflect um, the needs of our communities. What we're going to see is people really um, you know giving information from that they know you know local information about where their communities are, the geographies you know where the lines should be drawn or not drawn. Um, what their interests are in, in their communities. And of course, the testimony of different groups, um, you know, yours versus your neighbors, they, they might differ and they, than they will. And I think that's gonna be a big part of what makes this um, process so exciting is that the testimony that, you know, some groups will be, will be giving, um, you know, might differ totally from other groups. And it's all just, a, you know, it's gonna be in a mix of information that's gonna be available now um, to the commission. And it's, it's gonna be a public dialogue. Um, it's gonna be, I hope, uh, a really active um, conversation um, where, you know, the first part is the commission is inviting us now to give, you know, um, input. Um, we can submit maps, uh, you know, through a public uh, portal that they'll be announcing soon. But we can also, you know, we can sign up to um, to speak at one of these public hearings. You'll be given a few minutes. You can identify yourself, uh, what makes your community unique, why you're there, and why this is really important, you know, um, why this process is important to you. Um, where you live and where where exactly um, you want you know your community to be recognized, and then others uh, across the state will be giving the same opportunity. Um, so I think it'll be lively. I think it'll be um, a process that kind of you know rolls out, and we'll kind of see how it develops. Um, one of the things that we are marveling at is that this is the first time this has ever happened uh, in our state, and so it really will be. Um, you know, it's whatever we're all going to make it to be, which is really exciting. Thank you. Andre, you've been through this before. Uh, how did you prepare for the public hearings as a commissioner? And how would you advise the commission to make the best use of their time in these uh, hearings? 
Sure. First of all, I want to thank you and thank everyone for inviting me here. And um, I want to say proudly that I'm a former resident of Michigan, having attended um, Michigan State University. Um, however, I want to answer that question by saying, um, the first thing I, I, I wanted to make sure that I, I did carefully and, and extensively was um, read propos the propositions, Proposition 11 in our case and Proposition 20, as you would with Proposal 2. And it was important for me to become very familiar with the state itself and its various demographies and geographies and, and, so, and so on. And um, nothing was more useful for me than just using a basic map, an old fashioned map, like the AAA maps that we get. Uh, and another uh, ancient relic that I used was an atlas to just become familiar with the state to really know where major landmarks were and major activities and just generally just to be comfortable with the state that I was um, charged to be very familiar with, of course, through the process. It was important also to know a little bit about Robert's rules of order. We had a parliamentarian um, who, who basically worked with um, our staff, he was a staff person. And um, we um, also, we also had our attorney present for the very extensive discussions that we had. Um, but knowing the Robins of Order were, were, were very important, was a very important part of what we were doing. And I had to familiarize my uh, Bagley Keen Act, which is a set of guidelines that sort of govern how open meetings are held. So those are some of the basic preparations that I took um, prior to this commission. But we're all basically, none of us were experts in the beginning. We were just basic citizens. Um, uh, it's in our name, Citizens Redistricting Commission. So we basically um, were thrown together, um, the 14 of us, and we had to learn how to uh, uh, work together and make this happen in a very short window of time. I hope that answers your question. It does. You're breaking up audio-wise a little bit, so if that happens again, you might want to just stop Cam, uh, and that'll that'll help you uh, us all hear you. But we got the full answer, so thank you, uh, Colleen. Uh, what should the commissioners be looking for in these uh, presentations, uh, either the public comments or when people mention this uh, term of a of a community of interest, or, or they they present one that they have? Um, how did you look at those maps and comments in, in your process? Thanks, Matt, and thanks everyone for including me tonight. It's an honor to be here and get to address this group and hear from the other commissioners as well. Um, gosh, communities of interest can be defined in a zillion different ways. I think we all know that, and it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. So what has been mentioned already, the, that you have to go out and really um, sit in these communities and listen to what people are telling you. They're gonna be the experts on, on what their community of interest is. Um, I do think, though, that these criteria can be abused, frankly. You know, there's a number of redistricting criteria that you have to consider. And in Arizona, all of ours um, are considered equally. They have to be weighed equally. You come to find out when you, once you start to do the mapping, they can't all be executed equally, unfortunately. you got to, there are trade-offs. Um, so um, I think it's important to have a level of discernment, so to speak, when you're listening, when the commissioners go out on these public hearings, they should have an open mind and listen to what people are telling them are their communities of interest, but also um, uh, not to doubt them, but to maybe probe a little deeper and find out if they've made the case for what a community of interest is. Um, um, maybe then to go take that next step and say, does it really... Um, benefit from having that community of interest kept whole in one district, for instance, because I guess, you know, can there be times where actually more representation could be better, maybe given on because of a certain characteristic of that uh, community of interest that it's, you know, so large that um, it would actually benefit from more than one representative. So I think it's important to have them, A, make the case for what their community of interest is, and to the extent they can give you specific boundaries, boy, all the better, take them. Um, uh, and then, you know, pro do that, that additional level of, of inquiry to just find out, you know, do they really all have to be kept in the same district? I think that would be um, a really 
beneficial thing to find out and, and see how folks respond to that. Does that answer your question, Matt? It does. So thanks to remind everybody, we just uh, heard from Colleen Mathis, who was from the Arizona Redistricting Commission, the former chair, and Andre Parvenu, who was from a former member of the California uh, State Commission. And we're now going to hear from Kathy Fung, who is the National Redistricting Director of Common Cause. <laughs> so Kathy, uh, we just heard a reference there to sort of not necessarily always knowing who's, who's speaking. So how should uh, the commissioners uh, distinguish uh, the testimonies that were heartfelt uh, or from individuals and those that were mobilized from groups? And, and does that distinction matter? Well, um, let me just say that um, thank you again to Michigan and Michiganders for passing um, this major reform. Um, I think what's tremendous is that for the first time, um, as one of the commissioners noted, right, you're going to go from backroom deals to something where it's highly participatory. Um, in California, one of the first um, major commission hearings that we had after the draft maps came out, I showed up two hours beforehand and there was already a line out the door um, <laughs> snaking around the building from people who were excited to be able to comment on the draft maps and say, you know, sort of what the commission had done right and what the commission needed to change. And that level of excitement came from the fact that people not only had something to say, but believed that they would be heard. And so what I would say is, in order to understand how to tell the story of your communities, I would say think about three things. Um, so the, the definition of a community of interest is one where uh, there is a neighborhood or a place uh, of people who share uh, common culture, concerns, or count. Um, and telling that story of what culture you share, um, what concerns you share, and the counts meaning data, um, can be really helpful uh, to convincing the commission that your community is one that, um, when you say that you'd like your community to be drawn this way, um, for them to respect that. The critical thing that I think, you know, folks at the community level have the ability to do that's so different from how we did it before, right? That back room, situation where there was a single individual drawing the lines and just looking at essentially flat data is you bring stories, you bring impact, you bring um, depth to being able to talk about your community in a way that if you're not from that place, you can't tell. And that's probably the biggest distinction for commissioners as well, right? Um, let me tell you a little bit about the story of Long Beach in uh, Los Angeles area. Long Beach before um, our new commission had been formed was split into three different districts. And part of that was because there was somebody who was thinking about running for one of those districts. And in order to accommodate that interest, they drew a line to kind of scoop up that incumbent's house. In doing so, they split up not only the city of Long Beach into three pieces, but also an African-American and Latinx community into three pieces. Now that's just culture, sort of, you could sort of say, Demographically, what's it look like? City, you know, it has a certain shared set of interests. But one of your commissioners said, well, what if they want to be split? So that's a good question. In this case, because Long Beach has a port, um, <clears throat> and it's a major port from which a freeway comes up and it essentially distributes all of the things that come from around the globe uh, through this shipping port. And then the freeway takes um, 18 wheelers uh, to all parts of the country to deliver goods that are coming off of those ships. Um, one of the questions was, well, what about the impact of the freeway that goes through all of these communities? Um, and in fact, actually, as the community started to look more and more at things like what their health situation was, what the environmental situation was, they realized um, that they had one of the highest incidents of cancer and asthma. And so when they started to articulate the concerns that here's a community where it's split into three different pieces. Um, there's a direct health impact. Um, and because they can't go to their legislators to say, hey, uh, could we have something that mitigates all of the traffic that comes through our community? Um, because they had to essentially talk to three different legislators, that community asked to be put all within one district. Now, not every community or city will ask for that, but that's the kind of three-dimensional testimony that 
folks who are thinking about talking to the commission should think about, right? What are the, what, how do we describe our community to people who are not from this place and really give depth to the culture, the concerns, and the counts? And I think that the commissioners will be able to hear the difference, right? When you're from that place, you're going to have personal stories, you're going to have issues that you care about, and you're going to have depth of data uh, that somebody who's not from that area or who might have just been organized, you know, by an incumbent um, might say something, but it's not going to feel like it's got that that um, texture to it. Thank you. And as a reminder, the audience can still submit uh, questions in the live chat uh, or in uh, Facebook or, or Twitter. Uh, and the questions that I'm asking have already been called uh, from those that were submitted uh, in advance. So Nancy Wang from Voters Not Politicians, one of those uh, was about how uh, individuals uh, and groups should prepare uh, to present their communities of interest at uh, these hearings. Um, what would your advice be? And someone asked, should they say which communities they want to be with and which ones they uh, don't want to be associated with in their presentations? Well, I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, communities can participate. The great thing about this is that it, it's really an open public process. So as a community or as an individual, you can participate in any way that you want. Um, it really is our process now. Um, and I would, you know, I would strongly encourage everyone to, um, to, to, to just, you know, participate and not feel like you do, you need to do certain things or be, you know, have a group of a certain size in order to speak up. Um, I think the quantity of information that this commission really needs to draw fair maps in our state, again, because this is the first uh, process of its kind, um, any time in the history of our state, you know, is, is really um, it, it's it's a lot. Uh, we need to hear from as many Michiganders to make the process, um, you know, fair and impartial and data driven as possible. Um, that being said, so organizations, if you're interested, there's a lot of resources available to you um, to help you um, kind of, you know, have a conversation, a facilitated conversation with community members, um, groups like Voters Not Politicians. We have a community of interest uh, partnership program where um, you can sign up and we can help, you know, just kind of, um, you know, go through a list of questions and 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 um, have a discussion with with your members about, you know, what what does define your community for you? Um, what kinds of interests are you seeking to preserve? You know, what's been your history with gerrymandering and what kinds of things do you want to present to this commission to make sure that, the, you know, the the um, future lines um, don't, um, you know, have the same negative impacts that, you know, per perhaps your current district lines do. Um, League of Women Voters is another group that's really helping um, community organizations with these kinds of um, discussions and preparation, as is the Michigan Nonprofit Association. Um, and, you know, as to what um, you can, what else you can do to prepare besides having conversations, you can sit down with your, um, your community members, or again, if you're an individual, you just, you know, you yourself, you don't need to be affiliated with any sort of group to make your views known to the commission. Um, you can, you know, take a map and, and you can draw the boundaries around your community, or you can think about them and think about landmarks that you want the commission to, you know, make sure to either include or exclude within certain boundaries. Um, you know, and I say, I think as, um, uh, uh, Commissioner, former Commissioner Math has pointed out, you know, the more specifics you can provide, um, you know, the better. Um, because what the commission is really trying to do is it, its job is to draw large districts, you know, districts that, you know, where we're going to vote for our state senators and state um, house members, as well as U.S. Co uh, congressional representatives. And so it's likely that, um, you know, each district that it needs to draw is going to be um, filled with many communities. So it needs to know your piece of the pie of that puzzle to see, okay, which, you know, where are your boundaries to make sure that when we're drawing the district lines, you know, we're not splitting up your community. Unless, of course, you know, like the examples that were given, you know, there's some reason to do so. But um, so it needs to know, um, but, you know, in general, you know, the, the kinds of shapes that it, you want to be kept intact, not split. And then, of course, if you have the information, if you've been able to kind of, you know, talk with your neighboring groups to say, hey, you know, we really do share a lot of the same interests in terms of like environmental or economic interests, perhaps we are, uh, we all um, really rely on clean water. 
you know, in order to um, survive economically, then then by all means, you know, it's it's that much more powerful. I think if you have, um, you know, uh, an, an understanding of um, the different neighborhood in, um, the neighborhood communities that that you would like to be kept in, you know, together with in a in a um, representative district. So, um, but but really, it is flexible, and it's just it's going to be you know dependent on I think a case by case basis. Um, what kind of information you bring to the commission um, in order to make sure that redistricting works for you. Thanks. Andre, uh, the California Commission had a long list of criteria and Michigan has a long list. Uh, some uh, overlap, uh, but not completely. Uh, how did you uh, evaluate the communities of interest within your, your criteria? And did you have to think about the relationships at all. Does the, is there a community that isn't as contiguous that might have be in multiple parts of the state? Uh, is there one that overlaps local government boundaries? Um, should should people presenting to the commission be worried about where they fit into the criteria list, or uh, did you sort of hear all comers and uh, and figure it out later? Well, yeah, our driving our criteria began, of course, with uh, equal population. And uh, we began in California with our uh, four uh, VRA counties with Section 5, uh, Kings, Monterey, Merced, and Yolo. That was followed by, um, it was followed by, um, by um, um, our uh, strategy to, to, to have a, the smallest deviation possible, 0.01% deviation for for example, in a congressional district of 710,000, we only had a margin of maybe 7,100 to, to work with to maintain that deviation. But to answer your question, yeah, we, we um, our, major, our major factor, uh, in addition to equal population, and of course, uh, looking at districts to maintain uh, compactness and uh, to make sure they're contiguous, was com community of interest uh, testimony. And that was one of the main drivers. So uh, there was um, there was there was a lot of to answer to actually go back to the prior question. Um, we um, we took community of interest uh, testimony very seriously, and um, basically. Um, the, the overwhelming, when, when there was a conflict, for example, in our public hearings with um, some of the uh, testimony we received, we looked at the over, over, overall majority of the, of the um, testimony. And there were times where we were restricted by surrounding districts uh, as to um, how decisions made. We did in California was when a particular community was split in one area, for example, on our assembly district uh, level, we would uh, make modifications with the senatorial districts. We would call it the House and the State Senate District. So breaking up and, and putting together, uh, cracking and packing was um, a consideration that we wanted to be very, very much aware of. And um, um, if, when there were competing claims based on uh, communities of interest, we would simply have a vote. And the 14 of us would vote and uh, express our opinion about what we heard in public testimony and um, just basically um, uh, draw our conclusions and go through a definite set of deliberations about what that meant before we came to a conclusion about any of these sort of uh, undefined areas or these areas that were in, in uh, contention in terms of where the line should actually be drawn. So. Um, that's basically what I'm saying here is that uh, looking at communities of interest, uh, testimony was primary in our decision making process. So, uh, there was another part of that question, too, if you could repeat that again, Matt. I, I think you got to everything, so I appreciate it. Okay, okay thank you. I, Colleen, tell us a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about the uh, Arizona uh, uh, process for listening to communities of interest. Um, there's sort of an assumption, I think, that uh, communities of interest, if they are just presented, want to be kept together and might want to be kept together in 
state house and senate districts and congressional districts but um you had had talked about some potential trade-offs um with either being all kept together in all those districts or not so how, how did you think about that yeah thanks matt um so in arizona we also have constitutional criteria outlined for us that we um pay attention to and follow throughout the entire redistricting process and as i mentioned earlier the criteria after the two federally mandated criteria are um, satisfied. Um, that's complying with you know, the US Constitution and the Federal Voting Rights Act and um, equal population. The rest of the criteria are kind of standard redistricting criteria that I know Michigan is following in other states, California and others have followed too. Um, the, the situation with ours, though, is they're not to be taken in the priority they're laid out in the Constitution. Our Arizona Supreme Court actually ruled on that during Arizona's first commission, which was um, from 2000 to 2010, because people had argued that, you know, maybe those are outlined specifically to follow in a certain order. And it turns out they're not. There is no hierarchy. They're to be weighed equally. Um, and communities of interest is one of those. So um, gosh, in listening to all of this, this commentary so far, it brings up the notion of, you know, these communities of interest may not have neat and clean boundaries. Um, they, they, you know, there could be jagged edges and someone may assume, gosh, well, this, this, this must be um, no good. There, this has been gerrymandered in some way. There's something crazy happening in this border that, um, we should be suspicious of, um, but bad shapes do not mean bad intent. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind as Michigan goes through this whole process. And good shapes, conversely, good shapes don't mean good intent. Just because everything's a nice rectangle um, doesn't mean there's some um, underlying outcome that someone's trying to achieve. So you really need to treat it, as Nancy said, on a case by case basis so important to, to listen to what people are telling you, but then also kind of probe deeper, find out more about how, why it is that community of interest would value from um, uh, being in one district, being kept whole. Um, because again, there may be times where it makes sense to divide. On, on our current congressional district map, for example, I live in Tucson and three congressional districts actually come to a point in, in part of Tucson. Um, so we technically have three representatives that have a stake, so to speak. They should at least be listening to the constituents of, of Tucson um, as part as, as they make their decisions in representing us. So, um, you know, these districts can be very large and um, it's, it's impossible to necessarily put, for instance, all of Phoenix in one district. That wouldn't happen. It's an enormous city. Um, so there are going to be, you know, decisions and trade-offs that ne need to be made. And, and, and those trade-offs, um, you don't want to weaken, you know, a community of interest, um, uh, especially if, if they've made a really compelling case why they should be kept whole. For instance, Native American reservations, which I know you have in, in Michigan, and, and we certainly do in, in Arizona. Um, an interesting point that Commissioner Witches mentioned um, earlier is that congressional district map that was drawn, and I encourage anybody to go look this up to, to see a, a good visual of it, um, the congressional district map that was drawn by the first commission from 2000 to 2010 um, actually has a Native American reservation that's completely landlocked and surrounded by another Native American reservation. And that seems like, oh, hey, great, you know, we can put two communities of interest, two Native American reservations, in the same district, and and that um, would be you know that would solve everyone's problems. But it turns out actually that that reservation, it's the Hopi reservation that's surrounded by the Navajo reservation, did not want to be in the same same district at that time with the the Navajo. And so um, what Commissioner Witches was referring to is, to the commission's credit, I believe they um, found a way to honor this and respect this community of interest, the Hopi, and connect them through a dry wash because there's the contiguousness requirement. You can't just have islands um, throughout the state. You at least have to connect it. And they figured out a way to connect it over to a different part of the state so that they could be out from, away from, in, the, in a separate district from the Navajo. It's a, it's a fascinating 
um, visualization, it looks completely gerrymandered, which, you know, it is. It was gerrymandered for a specific reason to uh, accommodate a, communities of, a community of interest wishes. So it's, um, it also um, really, uh, to the detriment of compactness, um, it, it's, you're kind of trading off compactness for community of interest. So um, the commission, the Michigan Commission is going to have to make um, these decisions too and, and listen to what people are telling them and then try to accommodate those needs um, to the extent practicable um, while they're following the constitutional guidelines. So it's, it's really a fascinating um, case study, if you will, if anyone wants to, to look at that map and, and see what was done. And, and that was the map that was in force from 2004 to 2010. Thanks so much. And you can see that uh, the commissioners are able to learn from each other. They, the Michigan Commission heard from both Co Colleen and Andre uh, earlier. Um, but I, I, we do have some different um, criteria. For example, Michigan's are, are in order um, and include some that, that weren't in, in the others. So I don't want anybody to be uh, fully, fully confused. Um, but I, I did want to uh, pass on an audience question to uh, Kathy about uh, how the uh, how the commission should deal with all of this different information that they are going to be seeing. Should they be putting communities of interest in any kind of prioritization? Uh, should uh, they be organizing them categorically? How should they deal with the flood of information? And you're muted. I wanna take a minute to just say that the time that each state has sort of a uh, implemented the redistricting commission. Um, each time, um, folks who are on the ground really spent time to study uh, other commissions that had been created and took advice from them. So, when California was creating our commission in the uh, 2007 8 um, period, we actually talked extensively to the Arizona commissioners as well as their staff. And one of the things that they told us was you could make life a whole lot easier if you would just put a priority um, on which criteria go first and which go second so that we're not arguing and litigating for the next eight years. Um, and so we, we took that advice and we actually put it in. And then when Michigan um, went in 2018, we spent a lot of time sort of looking at, you know, what California had done and what Arizona had done and said, what are the best lessons learned? So I like to think of um, Michigan's new redistricting laws as um, really reflecting kind of the best understanding of um, what would make for a fully inclusive and participatory process and, and um, give a lot of acknowledgement to the way the, the um, changes that Michigan has implemented in uh, their redistricting law as, as real innovations. Um, what I would say about how you get commissioners to reach consensus is um, on the one side, it's a on the one side, it is about sort of how the criteria have been drafted, right? It helps that the criteria are very clear and that they're prioritized so that to some extent, there the distinctions are going to be about um, small geographies and sort of whether or not it makes sense, you know, when you're trying to get to that equal population uh, to bring in this community versus that community, um, but not whether um, compactness should in fact trump um, another criteria like uh, contiguity or communities of interest. Because Michigan's criteria are clearly prioritized, um, it takes that, um, any kind of argument around that um, out of uh, the, the realm of um, debate. On the other side, the um, side of sort of what can the commission do to start to lay the groundwork um, to building some rapport between each other. Um, just like Andre said, you know, when he was first chosen for the California commission, the 14 commissioners didn't know each other, right? They might have watched each other's interviews um, during the selection process, but that was their first time getting to know each other. Um, and it was really over the course of the next few months, um, planning, going to meetings together, but also planning outreach, um, planning to go to all parts of the state, 
uh, getting into a carpool <laughs> to drive to each, you know, each one of the hearings, um, sometimes being in, you know, hotels or new places and experiencing kind of um, the, the food or the, the stores of that place and sort of meeting neighbors and then talking with them. That became, I think, a slow bonding process between all of the commissioners where they're not only kind of seeing each other as human beings, but also learning about them in a way that is far deeper than just the D, R, or I behind their name or what they have done in their professional lives, right? Um, and in that development of a rapport, right, finding times to have dinner with each other, to talk about each other's families, to hear each other, right, they were practicing what they would eventually have to do as commissioners, which was listening to each other, um, having respectful debates, um, finding times when maybe your mind might be changed because someone opened your eyes to thinking about something differently, right? And, and ultimately having enough respect for the process, which I definitely heard from the three commissioners who spoke to us today from Michigan, um, a real respect for the, for the process uh, to say, you know what? What matters above all is that we have this open, transparent, and inclusive process, and I really want to hear from people. That's exciting, right? Because it's setting a model for the rest of the country that you can have a deliberative process, an inclusive process um, that maybe, you know, we don't always see in other parts of government, um, and that regular folks can come together and figure out how to have that conversation, even when there might be some disagreement. Now, there's oftentimes this question about, well, what if testimony comes to us from one set of community um, leaders who say we want to be drawn this way and another set who say we want to be drawn that, that way? And I will say I, I witnessed the California Redistricting Commission having hard conversations, sometimes to the point of tears, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking hard about like, what do we do? What is the right thing, right? And sometimes going back to the community folks and saying, hey, we're going to keep deliberating about this, but you all should also talk with each other, right? Because democracy is messy. It's hard sometimes. But rather than sort of taking up pitchforks and saying, you know, I don't agree with you and, you know, let's let's not have a conversation, what the commission process ultimately is, is how about if we try something where we deliberate together and we try to hear each other out? That's really what this is all about, um, that we can show that, you know, our little D democracy can work when we all come together. Will there always be absolute consensus? In California, with our distribution of five Democrats, five Republicans, and four independents, uh, all of our maps ended up getting approved by at least 13 out of 14 people. So it's pretty close. You know, it's not 100% agreement. Um, that's hard to expect, right? But there were enough people who listened, made adjustments, tried to be respectful of each other, that we came out with maps that reached pretty close to um, unanimous consensus and, and a lot of respect for each other afterwards. Um, I was just really inspired when I saw 14 people and what they could inspire us to all do um, throughout the country. And I think Michigan's commission is going to show us just as much and the community participation is going to show us just as much um, how we can reframe um, what's possible in our democracy. Andre, we had a related question about how the commission came together, um, how it built camaraderie, uh, how it didn't end up on all party line votes. Uh, can you give us some of the backstory there and, and maybe some advice to Michigan. The Michigan commissioners have been all online uh, with the rest of us uh, for the year. <laughs> so they might uh, just be getting a chance to see each other in person. How should they take advantage of that? Sure. Well, first of all, Kathy explained the process extremely well. Thank you, Kathy. You, you summarized pretty much the kind of camaraderie we sought to maintain. We also had a great deal of confidence coming into the process, knowing that the, the uh, um, that the applicant review board that selected us uh, did a good job selecting us. So we knew that we had various strengths. We just had to figure out what they were. So the uh, camaraderie that we developed by having lunch and traveling together and many of the things that Kathy said was essential, uh, especially during the most grueling parts of our decision-making process uh, as we were uh, uh, 
discussing um, various aspects about uh, um, the commission that uh, that we would deliberate, for example, for hours on one subject. And but we knew that after the deliberation, even though we had uh, disagreements, that we, we we would still end up at the end of the day um, being uh, comrades in this cause, more or less, because we knew that we had much more in common that united us than what we had to divide us. So that was the driving principle. We never really left mad at one another. We had um, disagreements. It's very strong disagreements, but the next day was a brand new day and we came ready, rolling up our sleeves, ready to work. We didn't harbor any uh, disagreements for a very long time. There was none of these little uh, sidebars, for example. Uh, there may have been, you know, it's just human nature to uh, like or communicate with certain people more so than others. You just have more in common with them, but we wanted to make sure that we didn't have uh, uh, too many uh, subtle subdivisions among us. You know, the little bathroom breaks discussing, did you believe, can you believe what that person said or that person, any of that kind of back, you know, behind the back kind of discussion, none of that really occurred. I mean, not that I'm aware of, of at least, at least myself, but um, basically we had a lot of respect for each other's opinions about um, uh, whatever the decision, whatever robust decisions we were making and discussions we were making. Uh, um, what's important too is that, um, that that we during the most intense period of the of the process, during the line drawing um, uh, activities that occurred near the end, end of of the process, we went through several um, two stages. First of all, we went out and got the public um, comments and input during the first what we call the iterations or visualizations. And then we came back and took all of that information that we were given, as Kathy explained, and, uh, um, and, and, and came up with the first set of maps that were challenged. Oh, uh, because during the public hearing process, we aren't all hearing the same thing. So when we made our decisions, um, that was based on um, the community of interest um, input that we perceived at the time, each of us separately as commissioners. After making adjustments and, and really listening to the community, we had over, uh, we had 34 meetings and, and 1,700 um, testimonies and over 20,000 um, bits of information we had to take a look at or at least be aware of. And, and I want to say something about that too. We could not have possibly handled the, the extreme volume we received. We would completely date it by. Uh, just so, uh, just so much information on ourselves, and we really had a very short window of time to digest that information, especially when we had work and jobs and outside of this commission. Because in most cases, it was not the only thing at the time during that ten-year period. So we had to basically read the information uh, on trains and airports. Uh, just wherever the case, wherever we were in transit for the next day, and then um, basically be ready at nine or ten o'clock in the morning to roll up our sleeves and 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 work to um, to come to some conclusion because we were on a nine month timeline to get these maps um, through for for 140, including congressional, senatorial, state senatorial, and so we didn't have a lot of time to be mad at each other because we had a job to or to look at petty arguments um, at least that's my perspective and uh what we ended up having was a very strange combination of of commissioners among us we had uh, unusual combinations we had for example one democrat from mature county who is basically a workers rights uh, uh, attorney and advocate are working with a Republican from San Diego, Asian Pacific Islander. Uh, they were separable throughout the process, for example. And, and we decided, as, as Kathy said, we were going to travel to these various locations together as a team to show the face of full commission since we were the very first one in the state. Uh, we had another combination of a Democrat, younger lady uh, from San Francisco, 
who teamed up with an older um, established Republican from Capitola. And they were just inseparable. So you have these very unusual combinations of friendships that occurred. And I can only express that uh, that it occurred because we were not just forced to do so, but for the most part, we wanted to do so. And we all had that objective in mind. So there are so many other bonding experiences that I could share. Um, not to mention that we have Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley wine country out here. So there was a little wine drinking along the way, but mostly we were there to take care of some serious business in a short amount of time. All right, it looks like Andre got cut off. While he's getting settled, uh, Colleen, can you talk a little bit about how uh, you got the widest possible participation uh, for your public hearings and sort of how you avoided just kind of hearing from the loudest folks or maybe the folks who are willing to uh, show up in the middle of a, a pandemic to the public hearings? How did, how did you get uh, everybody on board? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, well, before I address that, I would just want to I want to echo what Kathy said and what Andre said. And to the extent Michigan can do this in in your commission, boy, try to get to know each other as people, as has been pointed out. It is um, fundamental, I think, to a well functioning um, and frankly, you know, fun way to go about redistricting. I wish that our commission could have done more than that, more of that. We have a really small commission in Arizona. There's only five members. So a quorum is established with just three people. So because of the open meeting law uh, statutes that we abided by um, and the very polarized environment in which we were dealing, to be frank, um, we were advised not to trap. We couldn't carpool and we couldn't go to wineries. <laughs> it would have been great. But but we unfortunately really were discouraged from doing anything um, with all of us present um, or, you know, a subset of us for sure, because a quorum might be um, established with just three. So it was tough, I got to say. And, and it is so much better if you can all get to know each other as people. And then you understand where they're coming from, because I think only then can you then begin to advance and understand, OK, I know this is important to you and this is important to you. Let's try to figure out a way to bring the most of those two things, most two important things together and achieve it for all of us. You know, that that's so great. But anyway, so I loved hearing that from California and I, I wish we could have done more of that. So again, for Michigan, you've got a, a larger commission and to the extent you're um, following all the laws and, and not breaking any open meeting law things, I highly encourage you to do exactly what was just discussed. It's fundamental. Um, so how did we go about trying to uh, maximize participation? So we traveled all over the state, um, similar to what you've heard and, and what I, it sounds like you're going to embark upon. Um, do a listening tour first and try to hit geographically as many places as you can, but also look at some of those communities of interest that you know exist, such as Native American reservations, um, and, and, you know, try to try to hit those towns and and for instance you could be going on these listening tours and um be located and have hearings in towns that seem very geographically proximate but one may be on a reservation and one may not and so they have different foci and so it's it's really um i think important to to kind of look at your state and 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 map that out to try to maximize the the amounts of different communities of interest that you know already exist for instance um, it's super important to have an amazing website and, you know, web technology has gotten better even in the past 10 years. We thought we had a great one. Um, we streamed all of our meetings. Um, of course, we were all meeting in person. And um, so it's a little bit different, but we streamed all our meetings and we recorded um, all the meetings with a transcript and we would post that information online. So that, and it's archived so that people who couldn't attend the meetings um, but wanted to find out what happened could still go back and, and listen to those meetings. Um, I think having as much advance notice given to the public is super important. So to the extent the commission can get the word out um, as early as possible, and I noticed you had your list of, of hearings already with the dates, which is fabulous. 
Um, you want to make sure that information is communicated uh, as much as people can plan. Um, trying to think of other, th you need to have um, a way for folks to submit their input, of course, online as well to that website. That's what we did. Um, and so uh, we had requests to speak forms that they could fill out. They could say who they were, who they were representing, where they're from, um, and then, you know, provide their input. And they could also submit partial maps or full maps online to us that became all part of the public record. So having that really great portal to the commission um, uh, really, I think, is, is vital. Um, trying to think of other things that might be um, useful to, to mention. Um, oh, we, so we had a public information officer on our staff, and that person not only uh, did a lot in terms of collecting um, we had a press clipping service to, to ensure that we were getting input, you know, reading what was being said about us and all of that. Um, but they could also set, put out press releases. They could notify the public, um, um, just put out blasts, have having a, um, a, a distribution list so that people can sign up on your website. If they want to receive notifications of when the commission's meeting and where they can receive that information voluntarily. Um, I think that's a really useful thing to do. Um, I'm just brainstorming. If others think of other ideas, if, if uh, California has some thoughts, I'd welcome them. Uh, but things that come to mind in Arizona. Those are some good starting points, certainly. Uh, Nancy, we have some questions about how the public will know this is fair, and even some suggestions to make it simpler by just drawing squares on a map of equal population or having a computer uh, just follow some some simple rules. Um, I guess why, why, why isn't it quite that simple? Um, and how will the public know that the, the maps that come out are, are fair? Um, yeah, we get that question a lot, actually. Why can't we just, you know, have a uh, rectangle, the computer, you know, algorithm, just do it and be done with it. Um, you know, I, I think, I think, all of our, our co-panelists here, you know, will have great answers to that. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you look at the process that we've set up here in Michigan, you'll know it's fair because it's done out in the open and the public will have access to all of the, all of the information that the commissioners have access to. You'll know exactly what the inputs are. You'll see what the decision making of the commission is. The, the commission has to talk about all of its registering matters. You know, it has to be drawing the maps. It has to be presenting the maps all transparently to the public at large. It can't be holding any, um, you know, closed door meetings anymore, like like um, the legislature has been for decades. Um, and it has to justify the decisions that it's making. So, you know, once you have um, approved maps and under the constitution now, the commission can only approve maps with a majority of the commissioners. So of the 13 commissioners, at least seven um, need to agree on a set of maps. And of that seven, at least two Republican affiliated members, two Democrats and two um, that are neither Democrats or Republicans need to be part of that majority. So you won't be able, you know, we won't have any longer um, sets of maps that only one party, um, you know, favors or that gives one party um, an unfair advantage. In fact, giving an, uh, a party an unfair advantage through the maps is actually expressly prohibited and un it's unconstitutional now. Um, but, you know, we will be seeing um, a whole new way of map drawing and, and the, the ultimate transparency piece, I think, is what um, gives us all as voters the assurance that this is now fair, impartial and transparent. And, and now we have the, the Constitution, you know, in black and white uh, backing us up. So as a reminder, we are going until 8.15, uh, even though some um, invitation said we were uh, ending at 8, and the video will be available afterwards, uh, and those meeting dates are also uh, at the same location at closeup.umich.edu. Uh, Kathy, we had a, a, a related question about uh, how uh, commissioners can get out the positive information about what is happening in the in the commission, how they might combat disinformation uh, that uh, they might be seeing online. I know I've talked to a, a couple of commissioners are uh, worried about uh, the, the the public image uh, of the commission uh, and, and maybe misinformation circulating. Is is there a way uh, to to get around that? 
Well, that's a larger societal question. <laughs> um, I mean, unfortunately, oh, well, there's a couple different things. Let's let's unpack that question. Uh, the disinformation. One of the things I think that, um, as um, former Commissioner Mathis had suggested um, that Arizona did, and I think California did, was uh, to hire a PIO, that's a public information officer, to work with the commission to constantly kind of help put out um, positive information. I think that the commissioners should find ways uh, to um, appear and speak um, publicly about um, what the mission of the commission is and how people can get engaged, right? Um, the more that there are official sources of information, um, the more that people know kind of where to turn to. I think it's fantastic um, that they've already chosen to appear exactly as they have, uh, as California did too, which was whenever uh, commissioners showed up, they would find a volunteer who was one Republican, one Democrat, one independent, right? Because I think what it tells everybody is we are committed to kind of working together across party lines to figure out what makes sense for the entire state. Um, I think that countering disinformation also means that um, uh, there will be times when this, because it's highly political, right? And unfortunately, Commissioner Mathis experienced this firsthand. And, you know, even in California, we experienced it. Um, there are people who will want to try to take um, the redistricting process and um, accuse the commissioners of uh, not doing things in fair ways or um, accuse them of um, not being fair. And I think if they start from the very beginning, um, to establish uh, rules and guidelines um, that they're going to be operating by, right? Um, and those can include things like when we show up, you know, to public spaces to talk about um, the, the mission of the commission and what we're planning on doing, that they're doing it together, right? Um, that they're sending out messages that they're talking about cohesiveness, but also um, that they're really setting up rules where each individual, you know, through uh, personal integrity and, and commitment to the idea, um, refrains from doing things like speaking, you know, on their own or um, acting in a way that, you know, would um, sort of cast aspersions on the rest of the commission. One of the biggest challenges that the California Commission faced towards the um, latter part of the hundred hearings and meetings that they had was um, there came to be a group of people who would show up to hearings um, with big signs, which is fine, but um, also sort of shouting, yelling, and you know, disruptive behavior. Um, and what we do know is that unfortunately, you know, our country has um, experienced a kind of um, amped up emotion around politics that has driven some people um, to believe that they can sort of take any kind of um, steps to, to make their views known. And what I would say is that for the commissioners, you're all in it together. So work out um, good rules and protocol for people to participate. Um, respect that people spent time to come and talk to you. And then give them the safe space to, to share their information. If there are people who are coming to disrupt, um, you're doing two things. One is you're protecting your own safety, but you're also protecting the safety of those people who are coming to speak um, with all good intentions about their own community. And that may mean sometimes um, before you get started, having some rules you know, of engagement where if there are people who are coming to disrupt or spread disinformation or attack, um, that, that's not the, that the hearings are not the right space for that and figuring out what to do um, to remove those folks or give them a different kind of space to, to air all of those grievances. That's an important set of protocols to lay out, especially in this day and age. Um, but I think it'll also be important if you lay out what those rules are before you start your public hearings or you know, input hearings where lots and lots of people start to come in. Um, people will also sort of feel like that's right, that's fair. They're treating everyone evenly, right? And whatever the rules are that nobody is being treated um, uh, with uh, extra time or um, or less respectfully um, than anybody else and in doing so uh, you're you're already setting the groundwork for people to say ultimately the maps that are drawn and the process that was created was fair I should just say because of that attention to detail on process right in the end um, the maps were challenged in California uh, 
three times to our courts, um, two times to our California Supreme Court. And both of those times, the court decided unanimously, right, um, with a majority of judges appointed by a Republican governor and then another set of judges who were appointed by Democratic governors, but unanimously decided to affirm the work of the commission because the record was so clear about the level of public input, the level of transparency, the level of process, right? Um, the fact that the commission really took their job seriously um, in, in really respecting kind of what people had created in the initiative process um, in setting up the commission. And I think that the Michigan Commission can do the same thing, right? Set those baseball rules before you get in, what's a foul and what's a strike, and then stick with them through the entire process. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're nearing the end. We've gotten a couple of uh, questions about of the forum. Can we submit a community of interest of type X? And I think the answer is almost always yes. Partisan, nonpartisan, uh, or sh shared party, not shared party, small, large, different for different districts. Um, but uh, we're also getting questions about the uh, census uh, delay, uh, Nancy. So maybe can you um, address how that is changing the process and maybe we also use this opportunity uh, for your take home message uh, from, from tonight. Sure. Um, so we did hear from the Census Bureau that because of, you know, the COVID pandemic and, and other issues um, that they do, um, they are going to be delaying uh, the, the release of the census data to this different state. So now we are expecting to get census data rolled out um, in August of this year and um, no later than the end of September. So um, this is many months after, you know, you, we would usually get the census data in a normal year. So that does set us um, a little bit back and for in, in terms of where we'd like to be. Um, and the commission is going to appeal to the Michigan Supreme Court to get a little bit of an extension uh, of the deadline um, for uh, when they need to approve the final maps because um, under the constitution, it would have been November 1st and now they will get until, they're, they'll be asking until um, January of 2022. Um, that being said, it is a modest, you know, extension. Um, you know, we wholeheartedly support it. Um, we think, you know, that it, the commission is doing everything right uh, in this situation. Um, it's it's starting with public hearings, you know, right away. It's going to be spending a lot of time getting public input and kind of all of us kind of, you know, getting our sea legs under us and working through this process together. Um, and, and there's a lot of data that it can work with in the interim while we're waiting for the final census data. There's, you know, 2010 census data. There's um, other um, official, you know, government um, data um, that comes out of the Census Bureau. So um, I think we're gonna have plenty of time uh, as a state to work together and to draw, you know, um, a pretty good map. So we're gonna have um, a good uh, idea for what our maps are gonna look like. And then we'll be kind of, you know, gonna be able to kind of plug in the final data once we have it and kind of, you know, um, already be in our stride to get our final maps uh, in time for them to be used for the 2022 um, August primaries and the 2022 general election in, tw in November, which is, uh, beyond exciting. Um, and I just think, you know, I hope the audience today just gets a really good idea and the com commissioners as well for um, just what a, a, a completely novel, you know, a new way of redistricting we're, we're about to embark on here in the state. Um, I'm really excited. I hope everyone else is too. And I hope that you all, you know, it only works if everybody um, participates and if, if the commission gets, you know, from our, you know, from each person, um, the information it needs to work with. So um, thank you so much, Ford School and all the co-sponsors. Thank you so much to our panelists for participating. Um, I think this is just a fabulous event and I hope, um, yeah, I hope we'll just continue to have these discussions um, and, and I look forward to a really successful redistricting process for our state. Thank you, Andre. I think your audio is fixed. Any last call to action to leave us with? Yes. Yes, I, I just wanted to say that the most uh, difficult part of the process is the last 30 days or so. That's the most intense process. And there's a short window between uh, inputting the input phase and the actual mapping phase. So things happen, things happen very quickly. I think only that happened with you as well in Arizona. And uh, I just want to say finally that um, I don't know what happened last time with the mute, mute there, but I must have hit it accidentally. But you know, this is an incredible opportunity to educate the public in, in, the, state of, uh, in the state of Michigan. Uh, when we began the process, there were individuals who didn't know what redistricting was. 
I'm proud to say now that the people in the state of California are probably the most educated people in the, uh, in the nation uh, when it comes um, to knowing what gerrymandering and redistricting is all about. There was some confusion when I started about redistricting and, and um, gentrification. I had to explain, no, that's a total separate process. So now, you know, it's very clearly and widely known what we do and what this process is all about. I want to say too, and, and just comment on, on Kathy's comment earlier, this is an incredible opportunity for the people in the state of Michigan to deal with how polarized this nation is and set a positive example. You have mm -hmm. this example before you and the world is, the nation is watching. And uh, I have all the confidence in the world that you'll demonstrate just what democracy looks like and how it works in a very sane and sound environment. People are working together as one. So you know, our slogan, for example, uh, in California was democracy at work, fair representation, especially in today's climate that is uh, that we maintain that. And I just applaud you all. Um, democracy is not a static process. It's uh, evolved and you're evolving. And I just want you in the state of Michigan. And I'm glad to be up this program. And thanks for letting me share those final thoughts. Well, thank you. That's a good way to end. We've come to the end of our landmark uh, discussion, one that we expect is going to lead to fair elections and advance our state. Uh, please remember to check out the great resources from our sponsoring and hosting organizations, all linked at closeup.umich.edu. We hope you'll visit those resources and take part in the upcoming Michigan Independent Redistricting Commission hearings across the state. Thanks for your questions, your comments, and your participation. Good night.